have not signed in before and are willing to, John Nicholas right there would be happy to sign you in. And for those who parked in the parking garage block and a half over, Johnny also has the um, override tickets for reducing your cost for an environmental aid environment. And uh, so she's the one you need to talk to for those arrangements. What we have done in our scheduling is to say we will be meeting here for now the third week that Bill is presenting material. Then we're going to take off for three weeks. And some of us live where they're going to take off. In land, we hope to take off and land again. So that the next time we meet after tonight will be on the first Thursday of November. And we'll meet on three Thursdays of November, the fourth Thursday being Thanksgiving Day. So the second half of this six week series will be based on John Wesley's sermons on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Stephanie from our office will email to you the link for where you can find those 13 sermons online. And we'll uh, probably break out which sermons you're reading for the first Thursday, the second Thursday, the third Thursday. This is primary material. I think you might find it very interesting to see uh, how Wesley spoke. Uh, this is part of the 44 sermons, which became to the compendium of the John Wesley's greatest hits, uh, which means that they may not have been preached word for word the way they were printed, because he, as, as we've learned in the itinerant system, you either stay in one place and write a lot of sermons, or you write one sermon and you go a lot of places. And, uh, Wesley was certainly capable of writing more than one, even more than 44. But he was an itinerant preacher, and so there are a number of iterations of the sermons that he preached, and this then became the kind of codification of it. Uh, there are many more sermons in print than just those 44, but you go online to a site that's actually run by the Church of Nazarene, which is a Methodist. And there will be then the texts, and you'll read the uh, assigned ones. I think it's the first three sermons for that first uh, first. So just trust that Stephanie will get that to you, and that's probably the best way for you to access the material. If you can't get it, uh, call Stephanie, and we've got it in book form, and we can copy things to you. Okay. So this will be the third of our really historical overview of theological ethics. And then we'll pick up three weeks from now on the materials and how that theological and ethical framework that can be used to interpret John Wesley's sermons. Uh, what Bill said, Wesley said, was really the most important part of the Christian scripture of the Sermon on the Mount. So, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again, and good to see you all driving up here. Well, not really driving, stuck in the traffic with the Bears game. I wondered if I was going to be alone. Uh, so it's very good to see you all. Uh, I think the Bears are streaming as well, but we're streaming tonight. Uh, it's a joy to have you here. Uh, I've been trying to suggest a couple of things in the very way I've proceeded in this course. One is, um, if you try to understand and wrestle with the Methodist tradition, you're in fact taken into the whole history of Christian thought. So to think like a Methodist is to think deeply within the whole history of Christian discourse. This is what Wesley himself did. And part of his method is to see that the whole resources of the Christian tradition are ours. Right? We don't read only Wesley. Thinking like a Methodist is, uh, in Wesley's terms, being able to engage the whole of the Christian tradition, something that he had his itinerant ministers read. He would do excerpts from book, classic works, 
and have them read this so that they would get a, a broad humanistic and historical education. Um, I'm also trying to suggest that Wesley's cagey enough that he's also giving us a history of ethics. Um, and particularly that kinds of thought that were present in his own day. So thinking like a Methodist again is engaging the best thought of any period of time. This means that we see the whole world not only as our parish but our resource. We've mentioned thinkers from ancient Greece, St. Augustine who's in North Africa, Middle Ages, um, the world is also our library, and that's partly what I'm doing in these early lectures, providing some framework and introduction to basic ideas that will be necessary to understand his sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. He understood the Sermon on the Mount to be the sum total of Christ's teaching about the Christian life. So it's really what he saw as the core. Today, we're going to be focusing on notions of the highest good, happiness and holiness, but also um, spanning the two first concerns in Reuben Job's book. Uh, we're going to be looking at, the, at one point, we'll be looking at the golden and the silver rules. <laughs> you all know the golden rule, right? The silver rule, I'll get to this later, is merely the negative form. Or to put this in Reuben Job's terms, uh, Christians have prohibitions, what one ought not to do, do no harm, but also injunctions, do good. Right? Uh, one of the most famous exegesis of the Ten Commandments was given by the Protestant reformer John Calvin, and he shows how each one of the negative prohibitions of the uh, Ten Commandments implies a positive Injunction. So Christians are not only not to steal, we're to do everything in our power to make our neighbor's life more felicitous, uh, more bountiful. And Wesley's making somewhat the same kind of argument as we see in Reuben Job. There's both positive and negative. Uh, and we'll be touching on that, as I said, later today when we get into the notion of the golden and the silver rule. So that's sort of the trajectory tonight. And again, what I'm trying to do is to provide some context so that we can read the sermons together. I won't be lecturing quite as much. You'll be happy to know when we get to the sermons. Um, but also, we can engage the Reuben Job text at a, uh, an appropriately deep level. Now, are there any questions for me before I begin tonight? No? Well, let me sum I try to summarize what we did. Um, each time for the last time. So last time we explored Wesley's conception of faith. And we set that in the context of three common ways that Christians speak about their relation to God and how that relates to the Christian life. The three were obedience and law, love and virtue, and faith and covenant. And we're going to be doing a deeper level into those uh, relations this evening when we look at notions of the highest good. We then on, went on to Wesley's conception of faith and found that it had two interrelated levels. General faith following Hebrews 11, that is the evidence of things not seen, the assurance of things hoped for, and then saving faith which is a trust in and assurance that Christ is one's own Redeemer. The Christian life flows out of these conceptions of faith. One is to live and grow in grace and love under the idea of Christian perfection. For Wesley, this grace is cooperative. We are responsible to participate with God in the transformation of our lives and our world. There's a connection between personal and social holiness. And the purpose or aim is Christian perfection as the unity of happiness and holiness. And I noted before in his comments on the Sermon on the Mount that he talks about them as the art of happiness. I'll bet you never realized that when you grew up, you were getting, becoming a member in a church that's concerned with the art of happiness. Uh, Methodists don't often come off that way, but in fact, that's what we're talking about, what would be real happiness. 
Now we should also note a, con a constant danger in the Christian life and particularly in the Methodist life maybe. I think Bruce was sort of getting at some of this last time when he asked a question about how complicated things are to reason through. The two tensions in the Christian life are always between, on the one hand, a kind of rigorism. That is, you have to do every single thing. If you miss one little uh, obligation, uh, then obviously you're a sinner. And religion becomes rule-bound and rigorous and you know, shaming, if you want to put it that way. The other risk in the Christian life is what is called laxism. That is, the belief that, well, all that's really needed is just kind of warm feelings and a nice attitude, and that's all Christianity is. There are no obligations or duties. How do you chart the, the middle path between those two extremes? That's what Wesley's trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. So today we're looking at the notion of the highest good. I'll explain that in a moment in three steps. I want to talk about two kinds of ethics and their notions of the highest good, which relate to the two ways Christians have thought about their relation to God. That is, love and obedience. Okay? And then we're going to move on to the moral law, the gold and silver uh, commandments, and then end with happiness and holiness. That fair enough? Um, I'm taking you into this history, historical material again, so that you'll have clues on reading through Wesley's own texts, um, which are really an education in um, the history of thought. Realizing that you may not be able to get to all of them, but I hope you can read through a few of them uh, if you get a chance. Now, so types of ethics. Uh, there's a distinction often drawn in moral thought between two types of ethics. I'm going to lay out these types and then show Christianity is more complicated <laughs> than either one. And Wesley understands this. One type of ethics is called teleological ethics. From the Greek term telos, merely meaning end or goal. The other is called deontological ethics. From the Greek term deontos, meaning duty, okay? Now let's look at both of these. An ethics of ends or goods, a teleological ethics, and an ethics of duty, a deontological ethics. For teleological ethics, human action always aims at some goal, some end, some purpose. You have come to this class, I hope, with a purpose of learning certain things and growing in your faith and sharing that with others. Right? That's part of what moved you to come here, is a desire to attain that end. And in attaining that end, you are also saying that the means to that end are good. At least we hope they're good. Okay? So teleological ethics are concerned with the ends or purposes of human action in life and the means to those ends and purposes. The question then becomes, is there an ultimate purpose to human life? Is there something that we're striving for at all times or should be? And what would be the means to that ultimate purpose? Well, that ultimate purpose is what is called the highest good. That is the supreme end or good or purpose one seeks in one's life. The ancient um, uh, philosopher Aristotle thought that everything we do in some respects is related to our desire for well-being and that we never seek something we never use our well-being as a means to some other end. It's always an end in itself. How many people in this room want to have miserable lives? Probably none of you, right? How many of you want to have flourishing and happy lives? Well, now if you're following this lecture, you'll see I'm actually making sense of the initial test I gave you the first day for that about happiness and happiness. Now, much deeper level of 
what's going on. Seeing that those are, that question is around two fundamentally different ways of thinking. Okay. Um, <coughs> so teleological ethics aim at some highest good. The problem is nobody seems to agree what this highest good is, except in the most vague sense. Epicurus, from which we get the term Epicurean, everyone, everyone heard of that? Yes. Was an ancient Greek philosopher, and he taught that the highest good, happiness, what one meant by happiness or highest good, was having more pleasure in one's life than, one, than agony or pain. The good is, in the Greek term, theta, that is, pleasure. He was often accused in the ancient world, he's no longer accused in American culture. American culture is deeply Epicurean in this sense. You can just watch commercials, and it's all about how to increase your pleasure you know, through pills or other things, right? Um, we are constantly bombarded with the notion that the highest good is the increase of pleasure and the overcoming of suffering. In the ancient world, Epicurus was always often times accused of developing a philosophy appropriate for dogs rather than human beings, because it didn't seem to take seriously the unique character of human life in reason. That was not actually the case. Uh, Epicurus's own teachings are a bit more complicated. He actually argued that what we should really seek is to minimize pain because he realized human pleasures are fleeting. So if you seek only pleasure, you're going to have to be constantly pleasing yourself. We now call those commercials. <laughs> Every 15 minutes when we watch television, we have to excite ourselves again for the pleasure. Epicurus understood that now the real way to deal with this is to seek the cessation of pain. In the modern world, a man named Jeremy Bentham, 1748-1832, developed a unit, what is called a universal hedonistic ethics. The technical term for this is utilitarian. That is, we should seek as the highest good in our lives, the greatest good for the greatest number of sentient beings. But that is also a way of You all probably have heard of the group, uh, I think it's called PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment Act. They're utilitarian. Their argument is we want to reduce pain in the world to human beings and to animals and maximize pleasure as much as possible. Okay. So these are live arguments going on. Has anyone heard of the uh, philosopher Peter Singer? He was very involved in animal rights and environmental life. He's also a utilitarian. Now, part of the difficulty with, to, uh, with teleological ethics is that it seems to be the case that some forms of pleasure and pain cannot be directly sought. That is to say, I always tell my students, try this out. Tell yourself you want to have the pleasure of falling in love with someone and walk out on <coughs> campus and fall in love with the first person you see. Right. Can't do that. Falling in love is not something you can seek directly. Having a friendship is a pleasure you cannot seek directly. What you have to do is to try to be a friendly person, be faithful, be honest, and hope that one will have friends. The same with falling in love. Friendship, in other words, is a form of human pleasure that requires that one do other things than simply seek to be a friend, like be honest, be caring. Secondly, what's also missing in some teleological forms of ethics is what philosophers call the moral paradox. Jesus is the one who actually first formulated this. He who would gain his life must lose his life for my sake. A teleological ethics has a hard time making sense of that. Why would you lose your life if you're supposed to be seeking pleasure or honor or virtue? I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um. 
furthermore, hedonistic types of teleological ethics seem to confuse experiences we do have, for instance, the experience of sexual love, with things we ought to seek. It's not always the case that one ought to seek physical sexual pleasure with someone, right? But seems to confuse that if all one is to do is to seek the greatest amount of pleasure over pain. Thankfully, there are other ways of thinking about the highest good in teleological ethics other than in terms of pleasure and pain. I started with that because this is very present in our culture, I think. These types of ethics try to avoid the problem in Epicurus thought and modern utilitarianism. Aristotle, for instance, the Greek philosopher, spoke about eudaimonia, about happiness, human happiness, as the aim of human life. But he argued that the human good was one of living and acting well, and that this requires developing and exercising virtues, virtues like courage, honesty, temperance, fidelity. In other words, a uniquely human form of life must not only be about pleasure and pain, it also has to be about those virtues that dignify us as human beings, as rational agents. Conversely, the ancient Stoic philosophers, very important in the development of Christianity, thought that the highest good of the virtuous life should be open to everyone and is primarily about apatheia, that is, being unaffected by what is going on in the world, and doing one's duty. We also see a lot of stoic ethics in our contemporary culture. Sometimes this is identified wrongly with Buddhist thought, that the way you're supposed to live a tranquil life is simply to not cling to things and not be upset try to have tranquility in oneself, no matter what is happening in the world. Um, that's the stoic maxim. And to do one's duty in one's particular social role. The term they called for this, they called self-sufficiency. But human happiness is when we are sufficient in ourselves, untroubled by our losses, and doing our duty in our particular social roles. That's the best we can hope for as human beings. Now interestingly enough, closely related to Aristotle's ethics and the Stoics are um, several Christian theological visions. Orthodox Christians, Eastern Orthodox Christians, and one has to remember that John Wesley was reading the Eastern Orthodox Fathers, they thought and do think that the highest good of human life is to become divine, theosis, to be transformed through God's grace so that one is deified oneself. We might have to ask how close Wesley's notion of perfection is to this. On the other hand, the Catholic theologian and Saint Thomas Aquinas noted that human beings have two distinct ends or purposes, not just one, two. We have natural ends or purposes, and as insofar as we are bodily social creatures and rational creatures, we should seek to fulfill our lives as social creatures in terms of good families, friendships, loves. We should seek to fulfill our lives in terms of ends of our physical well-being and health. We should seek to fulfill our lives as rational beings by being in studying and trying to be wise about things. But in addition to that, Christians have what Thomas Aquinas called a supernatural end, a perfection which is found in the vision of God after death. Each of those ends, the natural end and the supernatural end, for Aquinas requires special virtues, what he calls the cardinal virtues for natural ends which are courage, temperance, justice, and practical wisdom. And the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. And 
Aquinas thought that God had to give one faith, hope, and love to elevate the soul so that after death one would enjoy the vision of God. The point here is, is that there are different types of teleological ethics, different conceptions of what the highest aim of human life is. Is it pleasure? Is it becoming divine? Is it well-being and well-doing? Or as Wesley will put it, is it perfection, a certain conception of perfection? He has a teleological element in his own ethics. Right? What then about deontological ethics? Are you all with me still, or am I getting too technical here? If I am, just please raise your hand. Everyone following? OK. What about a deontological ethics? Well, the remarkable thing here is not only do human beings act for ends or purposes, not only did you come here this evening hopefully to learn something and share with your fellow Christians, you also were on time. Why? Because human beings are also creatures that are bound by rules and duties. We set the beginning time at 8 o'clock. That implies a duty, even had to pay to do this. And therefore, one fulfills one's duty, no matter what your purpose was. So a deontological ethics is concerned with the realm of our obligations and our duties. Partly because the deontologist says, people don't seem to be able to agree on what they mean by the good. Some think it's becoming godlike. Some thinks it's pleasure. Some, some thinks it's virtue, as we just went through. Some thinks it's perfection. And given that, if we're going to have human beings live with some measure of peace between them, we have to think about the duties and obligations we have to each other and to ourselves. Where deontological ethics differ is what's the source of our duties and what are the most important duties we have. When you think of the double love command, does anyone know the double love command? Good Christian, come on. Love God with your whole heart and your neighbor as yourself, that's a duty, that's an obligation, right? Um, we'll come back to that in a few moments, but the notion of having duties is not strange to Christian life. The Ten Commandments, right? Now, sometimes duties and obligations have their source in the social role one has. If you are a parent, you have certain obligations in virtue of being a parent. If you are a soldier, you have certain obligations in virtue of being a soldier. If you're a teacher, you have certain obligations in virtue of your, your role. In other words, one way we think about obligations and where they come from in, are in terms of social relations. Honor thy father and mother. Right? Now mention of the Ten Commandments there shows us another way to think about where duties and obligations come from. They might come not only from our social roles, but from God, right? our most basic obligations. In the book of Exodus, we are given the Ten Commandments as God's Torah, God's law for God's people. It's in the form of the Ten Commandments, right? The Quran for Muslims, along with Muhammad's life and teaching, are understood important for understanding the law of Allah and following those obligations. This is what is called a divine command ethic. Our moral obligations are at root commands from God. Okay, everyone follow that? Unlike the teleological vision where people are striving towards God as their highest good in a Christian context, here the moral life is about being obedient to God's commands. In other words, the proper response to God's command is obedience. And this conception of obedience means to designate the proper motive for following the moral law. One should obey God's commands out of reverence 
for God's command. In other words, the Christian tradition, and certainly Wesley, would think it, be, it would be immoral for you to abide by God's commands because you thought you were going to get something out of it, or that it would make you look good in the eyes of others, or that you would be more holy than someone else. One must have the proper reverence for God as the motive of following God's commands. Not surprisingly then, one task of the ethicist or religious leader, one task of Roman Catholic priests, one task of rabbis, one task of imams and jurists, is to look at particular cases in the life of those communities with respect to God's law and God's command. Okay. Now part of the story of modern ethics is that the modern world um, attempted to provide some other grounds for our obligations than in God's commands. This is part of what begins in the so-called enlightenment. And the most profound example of this was a man named Immanuel Kant. His uh, moral philosophy is much more complicated than we can explore here tonight. But he gave three interesting formulations of the content of morality that he thought articulated what all common people in our culture and society, in fact the whole world, understand anyway. Okay. Let me give you these because they're kind of interesting and we'll have to see. He's a contemporary of Wesley's. He, Kant also thinks that the human, basic human problem is how to relate virtue and happiness. And it's an interesting interaction between these two different types of thinking, okay? So uh, I'm also giving you a little bit of Kant because he's the background for a lot of human rights discourse and a lot of other uh, concerns about justice that go on in modern um, political and moral thought. He had three formulations of the supreme principle of morality. First is act only according to the internal principle of action by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law and hence binding on you as well. In other words, Kant is saying if you decide you're going to do something, you should only do it if you're willing to have that obligation applied to everyone else but also you. We tend to like to have duties apply to everyone else but us, right? It was okay when I lied to Aunt Mabel after all, you know. I, I would hate to be lied to, but it was okay when I lied to Aunt Mabel. So the first one is that the moral law requires everyone to be subject to it, including ourselves. Secondly, he argues, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in another, always as an end and never as a means only, unquote. That is, in every interaction we have, we shouldn't see another human being as, as simply as a tool to get what we want. Simply as a means to make us look good. Simply as someone to use for our gratification. I don't know if you all have done that with other people. I certainly have, right? <laughs> We're all the time using people as means to our ends. Now he realizes that we, we will need to do that. We couldn't have social organizations. The kicker is never to use another person only as a means to another end. When we see the worldwide um, trade in young girls, that's clearly not meeting the moral law, according to someone like Kant. They're being used as means to other ends. And finally, he notes that morality, quote, consists in the relation of every action to that legislation through which a realm of ends is possible. Very abstract. He calls that a kingdom of ends. That is, we can imagine a world in which every human being is treated with respect, not used merely as a means or as an end. We can imagine a world in which 
we all act according, for ourselves and others according to moral principles. And that's what he calls the kingdom of ends. We're going to come back in a little while. Wesley will call that the kingdom of God. Okay? <laughs> have a very similar formulation in a few minutes. Now despite all of this philosophy, what I've been taking you through are distinctions used by philosophers which actually don't work completely on the Christian life. You probably noted I mentioned Christian thinkers on both teleological and deontological ethics. And in fact, Thomas Aquinas has a theory of law as well as a theory of ends. And John Wesley has an understanding of the ends we should seek perfection, but also an understanding of certain obligations and duties we have. The religious traditions tend to be more complicated than moral philosophy. Right? Wesley's weaving together a complex argument about the relationship between love of God and love of neighbor, neighbor as a duty, but also as the highest human good. And so he's not easy to categorize in either these two standard ways of thinking about philosophical ethics. And this is important because it means the Christian tradition is bearing moral wisdom that can be too easily lost if you think things can be divided between these two options, right? We don't normally see ourselves in that way, but in fact, we would not have Plato, we would not have Aristotle, we would not have many of the, the Stoics, many of the ancient philosophers if it wasn't for the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition and the Islamic tradition. So we have to see ourselves also as bearers of civilization, okay? So let's then turn and try to get into Wesley's thought a little more, uh, turning to the moral law. Is everyone with me so far? Are we are you hanging on? Yeah? Okay, let's go in just a little bit further and then maybe we can uh, turn to conversation. Every religion on this planet thinks that human beings have some rudimentary knowledge of good and evil. We have some basic sense of justice. That is, we have some basic sense that we should treat others as one would want to be treated themselves. Sometimes this is put as a moral law or rule or commandment. The great Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, who lived 110 BCE to 10 CE, so would have been in the world of Jesus, um, was once asked to teach the entire Torah while standing on one leg. And he said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellows. That is the whole Torah. The rest is explanation. Go and learn, unquote which is an astonishing claim. The whole of God's covenant with Israel, the whole of the revelation of God's love for the world and creation is merely a commentary on that commandment, okay? That is called the silver rule because it's put in the negative form. Jesus gave us the golden rule, which is merely a positive formulation of the same idea. Do unto others as you'd have done unto you. The same injunction in its positive form is found in Islam. In the Quran we read, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself, unquote. Now whether in the form of a prohibition, do no harm, or an injunction, do good, the silver and the golden rules are simply more complicated elaborations of Reuben Job's first two statements. Um, whether in the form of a prohibition or injunction, this moral maxim is also not limited to monotheism or the Western religious traditions. It is found in Hinduism, where we read in one of the great Indian epics, quote, this is the sum of duty. 
do not unto others what you would not have them do unto you. So one formulation of this moral law is um, a prohibition. It's the silver, silver rule. And the other is a positive injunction. And it's interesting which formulation a, religious, a religion uses. Right? Uh, the silver rule is found in Judaism and Hinduism, as I've just quoted. The golden rule is found in Christianity and Islam. But in each case, and despite the different formulations, what comes to focus are human actions, do unto others, human relations, as you'd have be done unto you, basic human desires, what you would want, what would you would not want, and these will be pre presented in the Sermon on the Mount and then expl explicated. The Sermon on the Mount, which as we'll see, runs from chapters five to seven in um, Matthew's Gospel. There's also a Sermon on the Plain. We're sticking with the Sermon on the Mount because Wesley did. Um, as I noted before, he sees this as the sum total of the Christian life. So the to taken together, the golden and silver rules, or do no harm, do good, right? Those are Wesley's, and then Job is common, uh, Reuben Job is commenting on them. So those are Wesley's abbreviated ways of getting at the silver and golden rules. The golden and silver rules present the meaning and structure of how we are to act, to live in relationships, with respect to human desires and human aversions within actual social institutions. The incentive for our actions should be desires and aversions that extend to how we treat others, the others that can be subject to our power, that we can either help or harm. And this suggests that the moral life is defined in part by obligations, by desires and aversions, by actions and relations. Let me say that again, see so if you, so the moral life will be defined by obligations, deontological ethics, desires and aversions, teleological ethics, within relations and actions. The little formulation by Hillel and the formulation by Jesus is already more complicated than the two types of ethics I went through before, because it links together obligations and desires and relations. Now, there are some criticisms of the rules that we need to note, and then we'll get to discussion. Um, and these are pretty important uh, challenges that I think any tradition that wants to take these uh, rules seriously need to address. Okay. Some thinkers point out that the golden and silver rules seem to ground moral obligation, what I should or should not do, on self-love, on what I want. Do unto others as I would have done unto me. That seems to make the basic motive for all actions self-love. Now, if we run across a Christian thinker who thought that self-love was the basic motive, he called it cool self-love. Does anyone remember? We're back to Butler and Butler's interactions with Wesley because Butler thinks that the basic motive of all human life is self-love. And Wes is going to challenge that. And it's part of the criticism of the traditional uh, understanding of the golden and silver rules. That is, if everything is dependent on what I want, and I only act or refrain from acting depending upon what I want for myself, then how can these be understood as genuinely moral rules? Second. If the maxim of action is grounded in self-love, then we need to clarify what proper or right self-love is. 
oddly, on either reading of the rules, the golden or silver rule, a psychopath could argue and live consistently. A sadist might indeed want someone to do to him what he wants to do to others. Some form of physical pain. Right. Everyone see the conundrum? If we say love others as you love yourself, do unto others, what happens if the person's a psychopath? So we must, the golden and silver rules then require some conception of what right self-love would be. And therefore, the golden and silver rule cannot give us the total amount of an ethic, of a moral outlook. Do no harm and do good without some deeper conception of what is proper good and proper self-love can be used to very destructive ends. This was, incidentally, the reason why Kant thought he had to form reformulate the golden rule in the way he did. One might believe and will it to be a maxim for everyone to inflict pain on each other because someone may want pain inflicted upon them. Right? So the golden rule and the silver rule, while they are helpful um, indications of the scope of our reflection, also open up their own questions. And third, we meet a third criticism which Christian thinkers have to address. Can the golden and silver rule account for moral failure? Why is it that sometimes we know what we're supposed to do and we just don't do it? As Job is very good at pointing out, Reuben Job, it sounds simple. <laughs> it's not so simple, right? Doing good and avoiding harm is not so simple. I'm sure you all know St. Paul's agonizing plea when he says, the good that I know I should do is not what I do. And the evil I know I shouldn't do, that is what I do. And he thinks of it as almost a foreign force in his own existence, right? Has anyone else in this room ever had that conundrum, right? Well, if that's true, then the golden rule and the silver rule cannot be the sum total of ethics. It can't be everything that we need to do morally because they don't explain moral failure or how we overcome moral failure. One of the reasons why Wesley is so concerned with what he calls the new birth, the transformation of the agent, is precisely he wants to say that Christian faith and Christian love gives one the power to act rightly. It heals us from this gap in our existence between knowing what we should do and having the power and the desire to do it. That's part of the reason why virtue and, and holiness need to go together. Now, a third, uh, the, uh, another option, another uh, expression of this third criticism cuts the other direction. The golden and the silver rules might imply that in acting morally, I must somehow deny my own good. Right? And oftentimes Christians think that way, right? We, we, we're supposed to deny ourselves for the sake of others. Um, how, so again, the golden rule and the silver rule requires some conception of right self-love or self-esteem as well as right love of others. Now next time, over the three sessions we'll come, we're going to see how Wesley's trying to address all of these issues. Because he thinks again that the Sermon on the Mount is the is the best picture of what the whole Christian life is about. And he wasn't a stranger to moral failure. He wasn't stranger to the problems of abuse among people. He saw the gin mills in London using workers for their purposes, hardly treating them as one would want to be treated. Right? Um, so we're going to see how he's wrestling with all these different issues that I've tried to lay out. Now let me conclude real quickly and then we'll turn to discussion. Okay. I've taken you through a lot of moral theory tonight. It's to help you understand reading his texts. And I've done so in order to make a very simple point, really. 
Wesley seeks, as do most Christian thinkers, a middle way between an ethics of ends or happiness and an ethics of duty or holiness. He defines happiness in terms of a complete love of God and neighbor and holiness is a sanctification of one's life so that one can love God and one's neighbor. We can say that for Wesley, the highest good is abstract concept, but an important one, a synthetic idea. It draws together two things, happiness and holiness. It brings these together in loving God and finding one's happiness in the divine and loving the neighbor and seeking happiness for them. And he puts this rather powerfully. I'm going to quote this from a sermon called The Way to the Kingdom. And he writes the following. This, I'm doing this also so you can get used to hearing this 18th century English because you're going to be reading some of it, I hope. So he writes, quote, but true religion or religion right towards God and man implies happiness as well as holiness. For it is not only righteousness, but also peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What peace? The peace of God, which God only can give and the world cannot take away. The peace which patheth all understanding, all barely rational conceptions, being a supernatural sensation, a divine taste of the powers of the world to come. Notice how sensual this is, right? He's talking about our pleasures and our desires as religion itself as a kind of taste of the sweetness of God. The powers of the world to come, such as the natural man knoweth not, how wise soever in the things of this world, nor indeed can he know it in his present state because it is spiritually discerned. It is a peace that banishes all doubt, all painful uncertainty, the spirit of God bearing witness with the spirit of a Christian that he is a child of God. That's the saving faith we talked about before. And it banishes fear, all such fear as hath torment, the fear of the wrath of God, the fear of hell, the fear of the devil. We heard a sermon about this several weeks ago. Well, do not fear, right? And in particular, the fear of death. He that hath the peace of God, desiring it, if it were the will of God, to depart and be with Christ. And he even writes that happiness and holiness are united Sometimes this is styled, he says in the same sermon, in the inspired writings, as the kingdom of God. It is the immediate fruit of God reigning in your soul, unquote. So we're looking at a change of heart, a new birth, a life of repentance and faith, that according to Wesley, and we'll have to see if this makes any sense for us, is supposed to give rise to a life that is both holy but also deeply happy, taking joy in life and banishing the kinds of fear that normally drive our existence. Okay? Now that's what I have to say this evening. Let's see if we can turn it over either to what I've said or we can get back into the uh, Reuben Job text or wherever you'd like to go, assuming I've been relatively clear. Any questions about what I've tried to do here? Philip, did I see a hand go up? Speaking of, I'm not trying to get a question yet. But what, I, what you've been talking about, I, I want to go back to the, the third part of Reuben Job's book of staying in love with God, which presumes that we are already in love. And then he talks about sort of the practical disciplines of how you do that. It might be curious for us to share what are some of the things that we engage in that keep that an open possibility rather than just a theoretical one. I'm looking at the first the, the hymns. Oh, yeah. Love divine, all love's excelling. We didn't, I hope everyone read that last week as an assignment, but yes. Yeah, the joy of heaven to earth come down and there's that plea in the first verse. By the time you get to the fourth verse, a lot's already happened. 
So it's finished then thy new creation, mm -hmm. pure and spotless let us be. So the sense of experiencing here God's love over time. Right. I'd be interested to know if there's any way we actually talk about that in, in our daily lives. But then a, a couple of hymns later is Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown, which we tend not to sing, though there are 14 verses of it. And there are only, only four set to music, so if we do sing it, we, we cut to the chase. But it's basically uh, the story of uh, the Christian wrestling with the unknown force, which turns out to be, tis love, tis love, thou diest for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee, pure and universal love thou art. To me, to all, thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. So given that kind of affirmation of the sort of the essential character of God's love being built into the world, not so we have to create it or find mm -hmm. it, but it's, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Reuben Job talks about staying in love with God, being linked to that question. Jesus asked three times, do you love me? Peter saying, yes, you know I do. I, uh, where does John Wesley put into practical, everyday terms that kind of love and then the kinds of things you've been talking about? Of, uh, when you love God and love your neighbor, what does that look like in good Methodist tradition? Okay. Well, two things on that. And, and one is we, we really need to grasp um, how immediate he understands things. <laughs> Um, there's a long-standing tradition in, in the West, Western Christianity, of which Wesley's a part. It starts particularly with St. Augustine. And it says, anything that you love or desire, you are also co-desiring and co-loving God. That the only ultimate objects of all our loves must be God a perfect reality, a perfectly loving being. Wesley, when he said, I quoted you passages, and we looked at it, and maybe it went over too quick, that God is that in which we live, move, and have our being. He thinks that every movement of our psyche and soul is really a search for the love of God. What we experience as things we love we only love properly when we relate them to the divine. So it's not that, just as you said, Phil, this is a guy for whom God's omnipresent all, all over. Um, and so how one serves practically that kind of God is trying to live out a life of love of God and love of neighbor. This meant very concrete things for Wesley, visiting prisons, setting up schools, feeding people who are hungry, worshiping, right? I said before that whenever Methodists came into an English village, there was a revival in taking the Eucharist, right? It was a sacramental revival as much as of anything else, something that kind of upset the local <laughs> priests. Um, so it becomes the totality of the Christian life. He would see meetings like this as one of the ways that we convey and uh, develop and grow in our love of God and love of neighbor. I'm not sure I'm getting to your, your question, though. I mean, p part of the issue here is that the, the Christian theologian is, and Christian theology is not a tool toolbox. It doesn't have an answer pre-given for every problem we're going to confront. Because the world is wild and life goes on and things change, what it's trying to do is to provide tools for us as Christians to discern and think through what to do in particular context. This is what Bruce was getting to last time, I think. Am I getting to yeah, I, 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 Just to go back to the practical sense that Job <coughs> has in this third chapter, of here are the, the Christian disciplines that keep you in love with God. It's, again, you've mentioned worship, Study prayer, prayer, study meeting with groups, yes, groups the yeah. sacrament, but Social also outreach, 
Christian conferencing, you know, you know, right. talking to each other about these sorts of things. Uh, those are practical experiences that he's suggesting we use as sort of daily touchstones for something that otherwise could become very ethereal or philosophical or uh, mm -hmm. verbal but not actual. Right. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Part of, part of what you may be picking up and what I've been doing um, is I'm trying to say that our tradition not only has wonderful practices that we can do, we're also a powerhouse of ideas in a culture that's so hungry for intelligent discourse about the human condition. So I've been trying to think like a Methodist, but, but you're absolutely right. There are certain practices that we need to do practically to carry on our religious life, and one of them is conferencing together. But maybe we should see what others, th yes, please. Um, I'm page 40. Okay. When page I got 40 to that book? point, I don't know if it was the time of day, I don't know <laughs> if it was the moment for me, but when I read, um, I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And then it goes on and talks about how difficult, uh, and the second piece of that on 42, this was the one that spoke to me after hearing that. This, me, this decision will mean I must seek good for all. I must seek what is best for those whose position and condition may be far different than my vision for them. It was a moment of comeuppance as I thought about the rains for everybody. The weather the last few days <coughs> has been spectacularly beautiful and the sunshine was for everybody, and the breeze was for all, and 72 feels good for probably a whole lot of people. And as I thought, as I read this, and then I was walking down the street, thinking about, we live in a world where the trees change colors. Really? And we like miss that? So if somehow the connection of the rain falls and the sun shines, and it's not up to me to decide. It's to me to love God and let it be that, <coughs> however it should be, that I should be grateful and that I should find a way to love them. Just for those blessings. You just gave a wonderful testimony to what Wesley means by one level of faith. It's the evidence of things in, in the changing of the trees, in the, in the rain you came to a sense of what it means that we live, move, and have our being in God, right? And then, he would probably say it was also an experience of saving faith because it issued forth in gratitude. Am I understanding what you're... Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and the realization that what I think is best, you know, it says, um, I must seek what is best for those whose position and condition may be different than my vision for them. I'm a recycled school teacher, and I think I know what's best for everybody. <laughs> That's not true, and that was kind of a moment. <laughs> this is where the unto others as one would have to done them with. We don't want people commanding us how to live every moment of our life. <laughs> so it would be required that we not do that to others. That's right. That's right. That was very helpful. Well, that's good. Anyone else? Just in terms of one's own practices, or yeah. Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's where I was going to go. Go ahead, please. And the 300 children in an orphanage in Haiti that will never have homes. So how do we be happy? How can I be happy? I crystal that. This is a real. Um, thank you for bringing that up, and thank you. Um, and hopefully we'll get a debate going here. Um, <clears throat> this is a real dividing line among Christians. It's whether the Christian life is about having some purity in our own life by not doing harm, right? Or for reasons of love, getting our hands dirty 
If someone's coming after a child with a hammer, I don't think my job is to say that God's going to let the rain fall on him too. I got to get my hands dirty. And that may require using force, even lethal force. And there's, a tradi there's two traditions that weave through Christianity, a pacifist side and a side that's related to what's called just justifiable war. And what it's trying to get at is are there circumstances when Christians have an obligation to step in and say this will not happen anymore? And we have to be honest that there's Christians on both sides of this. And now we know the scriptural reasons why, right? Um, it's the good Samaritan who intervened to help someone. It was not the priest. It was not the persons worried about their purity. I'm not saying you're worried about your purity, but is everyone following the tension here? Yeah. Now, you want to say some more? Please. Oh, come on, come on. Okay. <laughs> so then, to throw us back into the practices. So you make, you decide to do something, to be active, and then you realize you were wrong. Um, well, because uh, it didn't do the most good for the most people. So then, it seems to me that the practices of throwing yourself into worship Mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a ritual of reviewing right. God's love for us, even though human we are. Right. And that, that's my life experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Con and that, the, that's the, why these practices are so important. Right. The duties of constant prayer and constant communion, in a sense, are both undergirded by a sense that, as Christians, we should always be repentant, right? We never get it completely right. That's exactly right, what you're saying. Um, and that can be a hard thing to come to, but it's, it's crucial. It's that moment when one wakes up to what's going on in the world. But the question here is whether or not there are grounds for us to dirty our hands, realizing that we may be wrong and have to repent, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, please. Does this indicate if any practices were more important than others? Um, the Christian church as a whole has always said that the sacraments are the most important. Christians disagree on about how many there are. <laughs> Pro Protestants think there are two, baptism and the Eucharist. And those would have pride of place. Why? Because they're both places where we are brought into a new life, baptism, and then sustained in that life and to grow in grace, the Eucharist. The Eucharist meaning not just Holy Communion, but the whole worship service along with Holy Communion. So those would be, have um, a certain priority, at least for Protestants. Now, if you start decoding this a little bit, all of a sudden you realize, well, that must mean also prayer, because prayer is included in both baptism and, right? And it probably also includes witness, because <laughs> baptism is a witnessing to the world about a new, and so is the, um, the Eucharist, particularly with Wesley, who thinks it's open and anyone can come, right? So then you start having other practices that would be related to those two. Um, but uh, this is one of the reasons that Wesley, every time he preached somewhere, he celebrated the Eucharist. Not all, you know, I wish all our Methodist churches did that every time we did worship. Um, but for lots of reasons, we can. Yeah? Ah, yes. So we're Methodists, but, but we struggle between these matters of obedience and the and expression of all this. Um, we're in the middle of it right now. Um, are we to be obedient to the book of discipline, which are our explication of, of how we live together, how we might live together, and um, and what 
one bishop now is praying as biblical obedience. As biblical obedience. And so we have to live um, in particular, his um, position on this, we have to live in particular with this golden rule. <laughs> um, do unto others as you would have them do. Desire for others what you would desire for yourself, etc. Um, and we're in that tension now, and we're coming down with the law on the person who says biblical obedience is um, where I must live and work, <laughs> rather than obeying the book of discipline. This is particularly in relationship to our to our uh, and how we relate to um, the LGBTQ community. Um, so there's the tension. Let me tell you that the tension was with Ruben Joe. In 2010 or 11, a group of retired bishops said, it's time to get some of that legalistic language out of the Book of Discipline. Let us live to try to find a way. Uh, we invited all the retired bishops to sign that statement. And probably more than half of them did of a long and anguished letter from Reuben who said, I'm not gonna sign it because I'm trying to write this book. And if I sign it, people will not know where I am. And then he said, I may regret that I didn't sign it. So, I mean, uh, I think we live in a world where we want, tell me what to do. <laughs> Exactly. And how to do it, and that's not the Wesleyan way, in that's a right. sense. That's right. Um, it is to struggle in the worshiping and in the that's right. wrestling with what the heck does that hymn mean, you know? And um, um, and it's countercultural. I mean, that's where you started. The right. dads keep telling me how to right. how to be happy. Right. Um, and. And part of our struggle is we don't know what it means to be happy. Right. So I don't know what I'm saying about all that, but I think it is the it is this daily struggle of where's the law? I've got it right. I'll tell you how to do it. You know, I've got the answers. I'm a teacher. I was. I still am. So how do you how do you live with that in the face of? Well, this is in a sense what the amen. Um, this is in a sense what I've been trying to say heat session as I've dodged giving specific obligations or rules and saying it's about the community gathered to debate these things through to test each other's arguments, right? It's something we have to do uh, communally. But I've also been in, uh, trying, um, and maybe it's been overly um, concealed or subtle or something, I'm trying to situate the question of obligations and duties and rules within a larger concern for happiness and holiness, such that obedience to rules that do not lead to that kind of life cannot be valid. They just simply cannot be valid, right? Um, I said at the early, early in the lecture this evening that the two extremes in the Christian life that usually run aground. One is rigorism, or the term you use, legalism. If we just abide by the, the, you know, the letter of the law, everything's going to be okay. Unfortunately, the letter of law usually kills everybody. Right? The opposite extreme, which we've also seen in the Methodist church at times, is to say, well, all you really need is a kind of fuzzy heart and mild tolerance for everything, and that's all that's required of Christians. That is also not the case, right? Uh, because we want to be able to stand for something. But I'm trying to put that tension that tends to circulate around things like the golden rule and the silver rule within a larger context of a Methodist vision of trying to live a life that grows and deepens in grace that leads to genuine happiness, right, and is also marked by the love of God and love of neighbor, which is all we mean by holiness. And it is the work of the church. It's not the work of ethicists. It's not the work of, it's the work of the body of Christ. 
it's, it's the living reality of what it means to be in the church, at least as I take it, to engage in precisely that kind of struggle. That, that just is what the Christian life is, you know, on all of its levels. Am I understanding what you're... Yeah. It seems to me that the struggle you're talking about is the very start of your ethicist colleague that was a former dean at Yale, whose name is just escaping me right now, who is a United Methodist pastor. Robin Levin? Uh-huh. Robin Levin? No, no, no. Oh. he's at her. Tom oh, 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 Yes. Tom oh, who, who struggles with, I'm a good United Methodist pastor, and I've got a son who is gay, and who has been partnered for X number of years and wants to be married, and I'm married. Now he stands trial right. in the United Methodist Church for disobeying the United Methodist stands. That's the struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we've got an ethicist who's doing it, we've got a bishop who's doing it, we've got pastors who are doing it. And how do we, how do we keep the conversation at the level you're trying to keep us at? Right. Struggling with what does it mean to love God and neighbor? Um, well, the first and thing that's, in, in a sense, that, I mean, we're calling the rule, it's the golden law. <laughs> so how do we live that out um, in ways that, that manifest itself? Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. That, I'm just saying that sort of is the struggle of the Christian life. Um, and God bless the fact that Tom did that. We, we talked a lot about that. I've, I know Tom pretty well. Um, I wish there was a simple answer. Excuse me? I don't think Brooke and Joe wrote to the academy. I think he wrote to the church. And I've heard a lot about the academy. And I don't think Wesley addressed the academy. Wait till you read the sermons. Wait till you read the sermons. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I think we need to deal with a wider, <coughs> a wider perspective of the academy. I think one of the most harmful things in the Methodist Church right now is how it exiles its theologians. Can I ask a question on this yes. first about I apologize. What is the academy? The academy is a philosophic intellectual uh, group. Those who share ideas with each other. Is that a formal group or is that just sort of a generic term? Generic type. I think he's complaining about, if I'm understanding correctly, abstract language. I, I think as soon as we no longer can use abstract language, we're going down a really dangerous road myself. So we just disagree on this point. Um, my ministry has been dedicated to being in the academy under the assumption that the Christian faith wants us to think well and not be foolish. If we can't think well, how can we ever argue ourselves through the kinds of difficulties that she's talking about? Uh, Reuben Job realized it himself, right? Tom Ogletree was in the academy and brought to make that, made that decision on the basis of sound, he would say, sound arguments. Now, it's not the case for, it's not the requirement for everyone in the church to be an academic. I just wish the church wouldn't chastise those of us who are called to such a ministry. Yeah, did you want? I think there's another obligation to be able to do it. That's the obligation to be educated. One would think so, yeah. If, an example might be if you go into a home in Haiti and you're a white person going into that home, must be educated enough to know that that's going to cause a problem for the people now. Right. So you may think you're doing good, but you're actually doing bad. So that's a, that's an element of education, an example of education, where we haven't taken the time to learn how to think. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that applies to so many things that um, would make us more capable of doing good. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm so uh, uh, committed to this proposition, but I would wager that we could start now and it would take us roughly an hour to name all of the colleges that the Methodist Church has founded. I went to one. How many went to a Methodist college in this room? That seemed to be important. Um, 
So academics doesn't answer everything. This is true. Uh, but as your point, we really need to. So well, let's see who else has a comment, question, criticism, concern. Yes? It, it just seems as uh, Ray was talking that we seem so good at creating rules and laws that are beyond what really is there. And then we tell ourselves that we have to abide by these no matter what. Right. And that's where we kind of lose the do good. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're, we're stuck with something that was maybe a previous, in a previous time, and now we can't give it to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ideals of the past have to be updated in some respects. And right. And the way the scientific worldview has changed, doesn't that change also kind of the ethical conversation with it? Sure, absolutely. There are Hopefully, we think there are certain principles. Context. Right, the context we're in and what we mean by certain things. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, Which I think is also related to the basis of kind of this issue that we face. Well, yeah, in response to the business about the debate in the church, I think that becomes a confusion between politics and ethics. Um, and it, as soon as those become confused, we think that whoever can win the political argument is the one who's morally right. And that's a really dangerous confusion. And it's one that Christians who believe in a Christ crucified by the Roman Empire should never make. But unfortunately, oftentimes in the church, we confuse moral arguments with political arguments. And then we're fighting for who's going to have the majority. And how is that going to compel others to act? And then we get the law, the civil law involved. Um, and we take people to trial and so on. That's a real, from my vantage point, that's confusing political arguments with ethical arguments. And when that happens, then one starts to have real danger. Right? Um, yes? Um, well, I think on page 55 it kind of sums it up. It said if we, individually, we are our unique, and if we practice listening to this, praying to God, and uh, getting this small direction, uh, well, we will find the best way to be the best Methodist for us. And what's be best for somebody else is not necessarily best for me. And I just need to do the best for me, but I need to come to groups like this, hear different discussion, and take away what's best for me at that particular time at where I am and do the best I can. And I, I think that's what this is all about. It doesn't matter what you think or you think or somebody else think. It's my personal growing. If, right. if I listen to the small voice of God and that comes through listening to the sermon at church, listen to groups here, listen to different people's opinion and discussion, but my basic love for God, if I keep uh, praying and doing different little things, that's what's gonna make me the best Methodist that I particularly can be. Amen. I mean, my purpose here is not to convert anyone, not to tell you what to believe. My job is a rather humble and a simple one, despite what may seem to be the case. It's simply to provide ideas for you to think about your own faith. Ideas that are not mine. They're Wesley's and the Christian's traditions. It's a, it's a pretty simple task, actually. Um, in order so that we as individual Christians and in communion with others can think this through. Yes, you wanted to? Haiti is, and the children, and the, those who seek acceptance, and we struggle with what's quote right and wrong. As we gather together and listen and pay attention to what our church, what this church brings to us and offers to us, I think that's the way I can learn more about what needs to be done and do that which I can do, or at least understand it. I don't even understand the discussion that's going on in the Methodist Church regarding that particular issue. I've heard a little bit about it, we've talked about it, 
But if I choose to educate myself, who said that one, you know, good for me, even if, so I, I think it's getting together like this. You know, there's, it's just so healthy to hear and have challenges to my thinking to become more aware and better educated. If I call myself a member, I have an obligation. Yeah, my hope is that the next time you turn on the TV and you see someone trying to sell you what happiness is, you'll be like, gosh, we've got something to say about that as Christians, as Methodists. Yes, someone. I was just, and was going to say, I love what you said earlier about uh, Western uh, concept of collective sermon. Yeah. Talking about that a lot. I was struck by um, uh, this quote by uh, Henry Nouwen, uh, what, makes the uh, what makes the temptation of power so utterly irresistible Maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. Mm -hmm. It seems easier to be God than to love God. It's easier to control people than to love people. It's easier to own life than to love life. And it's probably easier to make rules to make it very clear. Um, right. And I, I would just say that in addition to the easier the, 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 the substitute for the hard task of love, it's also a mess task of love. And I, I just love this idea that, that here we are gathered, you know, we're not going to get it right. You know, we're going to try this, and then come on, we're, 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 we're doing good, but, but somehow through the collective discernment, right, it's sort of gritty, how are we going to get this figured out? Um, we come to some greater understanding. And that requires, back to some of our discussion this evening, that requires enough love to disagree honestly. I, I worry about a church that doesn't allow disagreement, either because it's too oppressive or because it's too lax and trivial. All opinions, everything's okay. I mean, we just don't want to offend anyone, right? If we're not a truth-seeking community, what kind of community are we really trying to be, right? So you all get three weeks rest from me, which would be a good thing. And then the, whoever's left, me and Phil, will be back here in three weeks. Before we another hymn, uh, Charles Wesley, opening the Kingswood School year. Uh, let us unite the pair so long disjoined knowledge and, and vital piety. This is not a new problem. <laughs> relationship between personal living out of one's faith and the cognitive understanding of uh, how do we, how do we live that. T.S. Eliot, who is not a Methodist, uh, <laughs> Catholic, I think he became, yeah. uh, who, who lamented, where is the wisdom that we have lost in knowledge, and where is the knowledge we've lost in information? Living in an information age where we have way more data than we need, but not a whole lot more wisdom. It is that nature, one of those disciplines that Bishop Joe talks about is a Christian conferencing, talking to one another, sharing experiences, sharing perceptions, sharing understandings and, uh, and differences, with the expectation that somehow God's going to work through that in order to not necessarily have have complete agreement, but for there to be growth in faith and growth in the community. That's why the church is a community of inquiry. It's not simply a number of individuals who are Googling to uh, find those with whom they already agree. So there's a certain, if, if we don't struggle with this with one another and when we go home with ourselves, then we're really not trying and we're really not being faithful. So. Uh, one of the jobs for us here is uh, to uh, provoke discussion and thought. And I think with Reuben Job's book, it might be good for you to read it again, because I think you might read back into it now after our discussion, uh, some things that you, you missed the first time around. And uh, particularly when you're able to see those practical disciplines and say, okay, that justifies why I went out on a Thursday night at 8 o'clock. When you get to John Wesley's sermons, um, I, I find them hard to read because 
they, first of all, in a whole different language. I quoted his sermon on Sunday, blew it completely in the first service, um, slowed down in the second service, and got it right because the, the language was, was just convoluted enough to miss the point. But again, he, he, he did, he's not giving examples. He's not talking about the time he went to church and put cookies in his pocket. Uh, he, he, was, he has a very insistent argument all the way through. Let's get back to the point. This is not necessarily what he preached in the open pit mine on a certain Sunday. This is the compilation of that thought. So read it carefully, read it slowly, go back and look and see what it is you um, might have missed the first time around. Having in mind some of the things that Bill's been telling us, what's the context for reading? What was he, what was he talking about? To whom was he talking? Well, who were the over againstness that he was uh, uh, having to deal with, with very, very practical issues right in front of him? The kids not going to school because they're going to schools, and the people <coughs> working seven days a week, and you know how, how that goes. So, it's, it's really a, uh, going to be a graceful moment when you have a chance to read through those sermons, do that over the next set of weeks, and then on the first Thursday of November, we'll be back here and we'll, we'll pick up, uh, maybe not where we left off, but we'll pick up with another set of uh, documents in front of us, and I hope it will increase, enrich what we've done here tonight. Sharon? So let me just say that if it's possible to get the sermon sent out, soon rather than yeah. the week before yes. we come back. No, it would, I'll because work on it tonight. Oh, and I don't mean tonight. Do you want to sleep tonight? No, my own experience is that because it's it's a language not familiar to us and so on, it helps to be able to read them slowly and maybe go back over them as you just said. I don't I don't think we'll get the most juice out of them if we read them in 15 minutes before we come because you won't get it read. Our attempt will be by tomorrow, no later than Monday. The yes. other thing is on that website is also a, a, a page that defines words that have changed. So it's, um, he uses ejaculation and it means excited. So I, I just, it describes the words in context for us, which is helpful. Good examples. Thank you very much for tonight, everybody. <laughs> Let's carry on.